Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, welcome to the 16th edition of the Cairo Talks in Transformation and Change, the CTTC. Um, my name is Florian Kostal. I'm uh, the head of office of the Freie Universität Berlin here in Cairo and also the deputy director of uh, the German Science Center. Uh, I have the pleasure to welcome you tonight to this talk. Thank you all for coming. Uh, actually, unfortunately, um, Dr. Roman Luckscheiter, the director of the German Science Center, he couldn't be here tonight. And this is why it's my pleasure to welcome you here. We have started the CTTC, uh, the Cairo Talks on Transformation and Change, in 2011. And uh, I'm always delighted to participate in one way or another, either on the podium or here in welcoming you in these talks. The format is actually jointly organized by the German Academic Exchange Service and the Cairo offices of Orient Institute Beirut. Uh, represented here by my colleague uh, Sarah Wessel, she's there behind, and the Freie Universität Berlin, represented by myself. Um, I think uh, through these three years that we have organized these talks, we have lived through the different waves of political transformation in Egypt, and I think all those of you who have lived it, it was not always very easy. And for me, it was always somehow helpful to participate in these talks, because stepping a little bit back, taking a distance, taking an academic distance and listening to the thoughts of, of academics who work from it from different, often comparative perspectives, helps you to put in context what currently political happens. Tonight's topic, EU home affairs, or home affairs of the European Union and migration policy in the Mediterranean, seems at the first sight not directly relied related to the transformation process here in Egypt. However, I think it is a topic that is very important for the transformation process in Egypt because I don't want to step too much into the, into the debate yet, but I think it is a subject that is directly related to the transformation process in Egypt in a way that what is done in Europe also affects the political configuration in the neighboring countries in a larger sense. Um, Dr. Jan Volkel, I would like to thank you very much who are going to chair this debate tonight and you have also initiated these talks. You have actually invited Professor Christian Kauder, Kaunert from Dundee University and also Professor Ibrahim Awad from the American University in Cairo. Thank you for very much for taking up this initiative. You are going to introduce the what I think are very eminent scholars and renowned speakers and I'm very much looking forward uh, for tonight's talk. And now I would like also to welcome tonight, uh, on the one hand, uh, Laura Oechsle. She's the, kind, uh, the science counselor at the German embassy in Cairo. Welcome, uh, Laura. And uh, also Mr. Christoph Retzlaff. He's the deputy head of mission of the German embassy here in Cairo. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I would extend also a very uh, great thank actually to you to to support us, the CTTC are one of our projects within the Transformation Partnership. We have different projects, different activities, but with, this is one of us and this on the one side sh shows you probably how much the German Science Center is sort of a center that tries to, to create um, sort of uh, symbiosis between the different organizations uh, represented in the center and also the activities of the German Science Center. A very warm welcome to you and uh, Mr. Retzlaff, I would like now to hand over to you. You wanted to say a few welcome words as well. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, thank you especially for your warm words of welcome here. Uh, it's a particular pleasure for me uh, to be here tonight. It's actually the first time uh, I have the chance to be with you and uh, I must say I'm quite impressed uh, by the audience tonight. Uh, I did a couple of EU-related events uh, when I was working in the Foreign Office on EU affairs before coming to Cairo. Um, and I can tell you it's quite difficult uh, to find such an audience if you do EU-related topics even in the EU and in uh, Germany. Uh, so thank you very much um, for coming. Um, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you today here to the 16th CTTC at uh, the premises of the German Science Center. This center, as you know, serves as the roof for several German research institutes and university pr universities present here in Egypt. 
CTTC, jointly organized by DAAD, FU Berlin and Orient Institute Beirut, is certainly an excellent example for synergies between these institutions. Let me say a few words about the concept of the transformation partnership here and then I will turn to the topic we discussed tonight without uh, giving too much insight into the topic, uh, I hope here. Um, on the transformation partnership, one important pillar of the German-Egyptian transformation partnership program, and this is the framework for today's event, is certainly scientific cooperation. Through this transformation partnership program in place since 2011, DAAD Cairo has almost doubled its funds and numerous Egyptian German cooperation projects have been implemented so far. From smaller scale ones like work workshops or summer schools for students to large scale ones in the form of setting up two joint master programs. Ladies and gentlemen, education and research are certainly key factors in the process of modernization and transformation in Egypt. At Egypt's universities, future experts and decision makers are trained and prepared, prepared to tackle the challenges ahead. Whether we talk about lifting subsidies for energy or about developing a concept to cope with rapid population growth, courageous reforms always require well-trained experts who think out of the box. Often, very often, the impetus for innovative policies comes exactly from universities originating from academic debates. International partnerships between universities contribute to the creation of sustainable structures, for instance, by developing new curricula or by bringing academic programs to international standards. With Germany being often perceived as the country of engineers and with Egypt having traditionally put a strong emphasis on natural sciences, social sciences, run often the risk of being neglected. I'm therefore delighted that CCTC already goes into its 16th round tonight, and the audience tonight, I think, is good proof um, that uh, the issue is very attractive. The academic discourse of experts should certainly not only take place on campus, and this is a very important point um, I want to stress here. Opening up the political discussions and contributing to the exchange of ideas with other stakeholders and the interested public is essential. Public fora, like this one, contribute to the development of a culture of open debate and constitute a great addition to the transformation partnership programs in the field of science. Ladies and gentlemen, before coming to Cairo, I was responsible for EU enlargement and EU external affairs at the Foreign Office in Berlin. I'm therefore highly interested in following up the discussion about EU policies tonight here in Egypt. The issues that we are discussing tonight are indeed pressing ones. How can we avoid further refugee tra tragedies in the Mediterranean? How can we stop human trafficking? And how can we finally design a migration policy in the European context? These questions are also intensively debated in Germany at the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I would like to thank the Orient Institute Beirut and Freie Universität Berlin for jointly organizing this panel, and I wish us all a fruitful debate and an enjoyable evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Retzler, for your uh, introductory words and already speaking about the seriousness of the topic that we want to discuss tonight. Because when I prepared myself for this evening, I thought, how can I start a debate on a topic which is not so easy to discuss? In contrast to many other topics that we discuss in social sciences, political sciences, speaking about the situation of refugees and irregular migrants is one of high sadness. Because the success stories are quite rare. And uh, when we look into statistics, it's always depressing. When we look into the stories of people that come through African territories or from the Middle Eastern area, hoping to get a better life somewhere, we hardly find stories that really end in a way that all people would say, yeah, that was a good idea to leave. So when we speak about refugees, it's usually depressing and it's somehow saddening. And it's for sure not purely analytic, it's always personal. And that's why I'm happy 
to have this evening here in the German Science Center with all of you. Uh, I met already people from the International Organization for Migration, from UNHCR, uh, from certain universities, experts from Italy, are among us, the American University, Cairo University, British University, uh, um, NGO representatives are here. So a very warm welcome and thanks that you found your way here to Samali, to the German Science Center, joining us in this maybe sad, but of course, surely important debate that we want to have, EU home affairs and migration policy in the Mediterranean. If we look into statistics, uh, the IOM has recently released a study on worldwide irregular migration, and I just quote some data in 2014, so the year that we are just living in. The IOM writes, up to 3,072 migrants are believed to have died in the Mediterranean. So already this year, more than 3,000 people lost their life, compared with an estimate of 700 the year before, 2013. So there was apparently an, an, an incredible ups as well in numbers. And globally, the IOM estimates that at least 4,088 migrants died in 2014, and at least 40,000 since the year 2000. And that's, of course, the, the numbers that we have. But as we all know from uh, research, reliable statistics in the, in, the asp in the area of irregular migrations, I believe, is very difficult to get. And it's usually rather rough guessings because, of course, we don't know how many people really go on this uh, dangerous path of irregular migration. So that's the personal side. And then we speak about the official politics. What can we do? What can we do in Egypt? What can we do in the European Union to somehow improve this terrible situation? And uh, as an European, I can surely say the EU is often accused of having too strict migration policies, that the borders are too closed, that it's like the famous castle, the castle of Europe. Uh, and there are two high barriers for obtaining Schengen visas. And this pushes many people into the clandestine migration. And in Europe, migration, if I'm not mistaken, is increasingly perceived as a security threat and not so much as a human tragedy any longer. And it's maybe quite telling that often within the European Union's negotiation, let's say in the EU Council, the Council of Ministers, it's usually the ministers of interior that debate questions of migration uh, policies. And it's not the human rights ministers that come together to discuss this point. So we could say, Security is the dominating driver for EU policies in the field of migration, and uh, this is at least what we can observe from the literature. So it's very nice to have two distinct, distinguished speakers among us uh, who have many things in common. I would say both are leading scholars, eminent researchers in this field, Professor Awad particularly here in Egypt, but also with a very high international standing. Uh, and Christian Kaunert, the same, coming from the University of Dundee in Scotland, but he's German, uh, so he represents a broad range of European backgrounds in his uh, personal vita and also in his career. And they have one more thing in common which is particularly important for me. I met both of them first in Florence, in Italy, at the European University Institute, where there's also a lot of research ongoing, and it was my great pleasure as a young scholar to benefit from their extensive experience in this Field. So let me briefly introduce both of the speakers tonight. We have here on my right hand side, on your left, Professor Christian Kaunert, who is Professor of International Politics and he holds the Jean Monnet Chair in EU Justice and Home Affairs at the University of Dundee in Scotland. In addition, he is the Director of the European Institute for Security and Justice at the same university. He was previously Marie Curie, a senior research fellow at the European University Institute in Florence and senior lecturer in EU politics and international relations at the University of Salford, Manchester. His publications are countless. I tried to pick the most important, but it's really impossible because all of his publications, and it's dozens a year, if I may say, so books and articles, uh, it's better that you check them on uh, the internet yourself. So his publications are uh, endless, and he's one of the most pro productive professors indeed that I have ever seen. In Cairo, he is now in the framework of a research project that we are jointly conducting on internal security cooperation between Europe and North Africa after the Arab Spring 
democracy versus security, and that's the reason why he's here, and we are very glad that you agreed to give this lecture tonight. Thank you very much. And Professor Ibrahim Awad is Professor of Public Policy and Director of the Center for Migration and Refugee Studies at the American University in Cairo. From 1999 to 2010, he held several positions with regional and global United Nations organizations, such as the Director's Post of the International Migration Program at the International Labour Organization, ILO, in Geneva. He is one of the most distinguished experts on migration in the Mediterranean, not only in Egypt, but as I said, already worldwide, with also an impressive list of publications and an uncounted number of invitations for conferences, workshops and seminars. And from a personal perspective, I might say that Professor Awad is one of my secret models. I wrote it down, as I will never forget indeed how friendly he treated me when I, at that time still at my early stage of my career, uh, I asked him for an interview on migration in the Mediterranean and he directly responded in a very encouraging and friendly way and he shared his impressive knowledge and experience over a good cup of tea uh, in a nice cafe in the hills over Florence. Indeed, thank you very much for this great beginning and thanks for being here. And we agreed that Christian Kaunert will give the first input of maximum 20 minutes. The lecture will be given from there. After 15 minutes, I give you a sign that five more minutes are about to come. And after 20 minutes, I will strictly stop so that we have then another 20 minutes with Professor Awad before we go into the discussion. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours. Right, let me first check the microphone. Can you all hear me? OK, fantastic. Well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the organizers. I'm absolutely delighted and thrilled to be here tonight. Um, the turnout is just overwhelming. I'm absolutely thrilled. It's very rare that I have such a good turnout, so I'm extremely delighted. It's really a testament to the great organizational skills of the organizers. I think this is absolutely wonderful. I think, and I hope, it's also deserved uh, not so much because of me, but because of the topic. I think the topic is one of enormous importance, and I'm absolutely thrilled that there'll be so many people here to hear me speak about it. Now, let me just give you a little bit of background. The topic is one that myself and my wife, Dr. Sarah Leonard, had done a joint research project in terms of refugee security in the European Union. We published several articles on the topic and there'll be a book coming out next year with Routledge. So if you want to pre-order it, it's already available on Amazon. So um, I've, I've, I've left my little advertising here right at the beginning. Um, the project we've done over several years, because we've done several interviews uh, in Brussels, in the European Union institutions. We've done interviews in Spain with NGOs that really know a lot about um, refugees and irregular migrants that have arrived in Spain, we've done interviews in Malta, we've done interviews in various places in the European Union. So I hope that what I'm saying is going to be interesting to you. I'll start the presentation a little bit basic, so I know that some of you are very much experts on the topic, but I thought uh, just to introduce the topic it might, uh, might be interesting just to outline some of the basics, but as we get on I, I hope that I, I won't let you down so much. Now, what is the topic that I want to talk about. The topic is about refugees. So I thought, as I'm going to start about talking about refugees, let's just define what a refugee is. Now, we're discussing quite a lot about you know, how security nowadays is at the heart of you know, refugees and policies becoming more and more securitized. But of course, the very essence of a refugee is already with security at the heart of it, because refugees are fleeing from a conflict. They are fleeing from a uh, usually a quite a horrific situation. And in fact, when refugees and, 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 and asylum were um, designed as a concept, uh, at the very heart of that was, of course, the Second World War. The experience of the Second World War, and it, it's important to remember that the horrors of the Second World War led the world to think, well, is that really the way to go? Should we, as human beings, not do more for those people? Then it led to the organization that I know that some of you 
in the room are working for, and that is, of course, the creation of the UNHCR, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee, which, in a sense, was a successor organization. In fact, the League of Nations already had an organization that was linked to refugees before, not one that was perceived as being particularly successful. Nonetheless, there was a kind of a historical legacy in terms of what it was to deal with refugees. 1951, we had the UN Convention relating to the status of refugees, the so-called Geneva Convention. Now, how is a refugee defined? A refugee, under the terms of the Geneva Convention, someone outside his or her country of origin and unable to return as a result of a well-founded fear of persecution on the grounds of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership of a particular, particular social group. In fact, the Geneva Convention provides for the right to seek asylum. In fact, it does not give, him, uh, give the person a right to asylum as such. It's only the right to seek asylum. And in fact, it prohibits the so-called refoulement. So that means um, the fact of being sent back to the country where the persecution comes from. Sorry, I hope you still hear me well. Now, having defined uh, refugee policy, let me move on a little bit towards the role of the European Union. Now, what struck me at the beginning of having looked at this policy area is it, it's kind of a, a very strange policy area. In, in fact, we have contradictory developments really happening at the same time. And those developments are following. On the one hand, I think it's right to say uh, what Jan said earlier about the difficulty of getting into Europe. We have many discussions had about so-called notions of fortress Europe, it's getting harder to settle foot, and many, many people die in the Mediterranean. Many people die after either um, problems with boats or smugglers or whatever it is that they're dying uh, for in the end. Sometimes they just die because nobody's there to rescue them. It's not necessarily that they would have to die, but they're put in a particular situation where you know, they might run out of food or whatever, and nobody's there to rescue them. So you have that development at the same time as having other developments. Because if we merely look at the legal level, what we actually find is that rights for eventual refugees have actually been strengthened in the European Union. If we look at the rights that they have and the procedures that they go through, we actually find they're much higher than they used to be 10, 15 years ago. So the rights are at a better level than what they were, at least in a significant number of European countries. So how can we explain this very strange dichotomy when on the one hand we have more and better rights, but on the other hand we have less and less people? And I'm not talking about absolute numbers, I'm talking about percentage of people trying to get in that manage to get into Europe. Now, if we look at what other academics have said. Well, a number of people were kind of wondering, well, why is the European Union getting involved in this area at all? Isn't that an area that should be dealt with with individual member states? It's, it's national policy. And for many decades, in fact, it has been national policy. Why is the European Union getting involved in this? Now, the arguments that were made is that, in fact, the reason why the European Union is getting involved in this is because interior ministers, national interior ministers, are interested to reduce numbers. It's a budgetary issue. They don't want to pay as much. By reducing numbers, they're going to the level of the European Union where it's easier to reduce numbers. The reason for that, that has been given by the academic literature, is that at national level, over the decades, national constitutions have kind of put some judicial constraints on what individual national ministers can do. Judges interfere with some of their policies. There's also increased organization of those who advocate for uh, migrants and refugees, including labor ministries, poor migrant NGOs, and so on. Now, the argument that those scholars have put forward is that at the EU level, they do not face those constraints. The EU is new. The institutions are new. People aren't so well organized. So at, at that point, you might manage to shift policy outcomes from uh, those that you have towards your desired policy outcomes. However, at the same time, these arguments were made, especially in the 1990s, when you know, the field was still very young, when not so many policy developments had yet occurred. 
But since then, the European Union has also changed quite considerably. If we look back, we have now new institutions in the European Union. For instance, we have the new European Asylum Support Office that specifically um, deals with refugees. We have a number of new treaties, such as the Lisbon Treaty, that was just ratified in 2009, which provides for significant new competence and significantly new rights for refugees as well. So we need to really think about to what extent is this argument still true. Now, I have a whole presentation here about theoretically making these arguments. I'm going to skip those and I'm going to go straight to the more empirical points. What has changed in the European Union that is enabling us to have a slightly more liberal approach when it comes to providing refugees with rights while at the same time trying to keep them out? And why is this happening at all? Why is there those two, in a sense, opposing logics happening at the same time, where one seems to counteract the other? Well, at the EU level, what we find is we have a significant increase in rights. We have uh, adopted a number of different instruments, uh, for instance, the Reception Conditions Directive, the Qualifications Directive, the Procedures Directive, the Dublin Regulation. Those are the four main instruments, if I want to go through them, that the European Union has adopted. I'm not going to go into all the details of what rights refugees have, because it would be another 20 minutes discussion, at least probably more than that. But just to give you the, the kind of key outlines where the European Union has um, benefited refugees. Firstly, it brought the reception conditions uh, that refugees, once they are accepted as refugees, receive within the member states. It, it brought it at the higher level. What traditionally happened is, not in all countries, I, I might add, but certainly in a number of countries, if I look at the situation, for instance, in Spain, if I look at the situation, for instance, in Malta, refugees had very, very bad reception conditions uh, prior. Refugees, uh, in fact, uh, didn't have many rights as such in terms of what kind of conditions would await them. Now, this directive has, in fact, brought the reception conditions much closer to one another. It has redefined also the terms of the Geneva Convention. It has redefined it in a way which has actually broadened the Geneva Convention in the sense that it now also includes applicants for asylum, family members, unaccompanied minors, reception conditions and, and detention. The Asylum Qualification Directive, which redefined the scope of refugees, has now also included persecution, for instance, from non-state actors. Traditionally, refugees were only accepted if they were um, uh, if they were persecuted by state actors. It has now included new forms of persecution that we've seen happening over time. I mean, it's not too surprising to think that you know, when the convention was written in the 1950s the drafters of the, con the convention couldn't conceive of all the various forms in which people could be persecuted and for what reasons people could be persecuted. They just took the ones that they knew. But of course it is an in international instrument. It's very difficult to change that instrument over time, which means that we've now found that people are actually persecuted for many, many more reasons than what the drafters thought. They could be persecuted, for instance, because of certain child and gender-specific forms of persecution. Persecution could even occur, you know, we've discussed LGBT issues before. You know, there's a variety of different reasons why people are being persecuted. And in fact, this new, well, it's not so new anymore now, but, but the second version of the directive is, this directive has actually increased the scope. In a sense, it has broadened the Geneva Convention, it has brought new value in terms of um, the procedures are much better. However, we can, from, from those developments, what we can see is certainly that there has been improvement in terms of international protection, in terms of the standards, compared to the previous situation. Now, why am I saying that? Well, 
previous situation wasn't all that high in the standards to begin with. Um, so in a way, it shouldn't surprise us that we've managed to surpass those standards, because in a number of countries, um, especially those that traditionally didn't see themselves as uh, countries of destination, uh, that were seeing themselves more as transit countries, well, in those countries, generally, the standards have been fairly low, um, just a number of years ago, not, not that long ago. So the European Union, in its efforts, has actually improved those standards. Admittedly, um, not to a very high level, but in very difficult circumstances. It has prevented the race to the bottom between member states, because before, what happened was when member states suddenly saw a huge influx of refugees, they tried to reduce the rights in order to bring the, uh, <laughs> the influx of refugees down. But of course, once one member state had reduced the level of rights, there was now an incentive for other member states to do the same, because there was now an incentive for refugees to go to that very country where the rights were still higher. So you could have had a situation where you have a race to the bottom. In this particular case, I pick out countries such as Spain and Portugal merely because I've done a lot of research on Spain and Portugal. The European directives have actually increased um, uh, the level of rights, in particular in the procedural. What happened in Spain very often was that procedures were biased in a way that um, it was very difficult for people to really um, apply for asylum, even if you had a prima facie case to apply for asylum. As a result of that, a lot of people did never bother to really apply for asylum in Spain because it was just so hard to apply for asylum. The procedures were really biased against them. Now, the European legislation has kind of remedied this. We find a similar situation actually in Malta, um, where a lot of the, the procedural um, stuff was really left, uh, to, when it was still left to member states, um, a lot of refugees didn't really bother applying for asylum because it was just too hard. So we have actually got a better situation. Why am I not saying, hooray, we're there? Well. If you continue the logic, if indeed it were true at some point that national member states were going to the level of the European Union in order to decrease uh, the numbers, well, what would be the logical solution? What would you do? Well, you would try and decrease numbers. If you can't decrease rights, which cost you, then you have to decrease numbers. There's, there's no other way in, in which you can uh, reduce your budget. And of course, this is what we do see to a certain extent. We do see attempts to decrease numbers. Now, let me tell you a little bit about how am I doing with five time? Minutes, minutes. I have five minutes, okay. Well, in those five minutes, let me just give you the other side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is, of course, the external border agency, Frontex. Now, to a certain extent, the external border agency, Frontex, has become a little bit of a... Um, has had a certain hate relationship with some of the NGOs, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for bad reasons. Because the good reasons is, of course, Frontex is supporting strict border policies. Bad reasons, it's Frontex is really working for the member states. It's not an independent actor as such. So sometimes the level of um, antipathy should sometimes be directed more at the level of member states than at the agency. But still, let me give you an outline of what it does. In 2004, Frontex, the European Agency for the Management of Operational Cooperation at the external borders of the member states of the European Union. And this is the only time that I'm going to mention the entire name because it's far too long to mention that. I'll just refer to it, Frontex. It was created in 2004 by a European Council regulation 2007-2004 of 26th of October 2004. Started operations in 2005 and became quite a controversial agency as such. The origins were primarily of cooperation in terms of border management, challenges associated with EU enlargement and of course 9-11 when there was still a lot of fear about terrorists coming in. So at the time, uh, Frontex was also seen as a potential you know, oops, obstacle of uh, preventing terrorists from coming in. Now, why was Frontex created? 
a number of people put forward different suggestions. Certainly not enough information, so there was a need for more technical knowledge. I think there's certainly part of that. Political uncertainty, you don't know how governments are going to react in the future. Lack of cooperation, power struggles between different member states. Blame shifting, partially also. Frontex is of course a fantastic agency in the sense that member states that want a particular a policy can hide behind the agency because it's the agency doing the business or at least it looks like the agency is doing the business and I've certainly done many interviews in Frontex where people have always pointed out well we're merely the support agency we're not the ones deciding the policy we're just implementing what the member states tell us to implement and of course as such it fulfills a very useful set of functions member states can hide behind the agency to a certain extent they don't have to take responsibility for the political decisions that they take as much as they might have to otherwise. So, what does Frontex do that is so controversial? Well, it doesn't sound as much, but it coordinates the operational cooperation between member states regarding the management of external borders. It provides for assistance to the training of national border guards, and it conducts risk analysis. Risk analysis is a Funny thing, um, we try to sometimes get some of the risk analysis reports and, and very occasionally you actually manage to get one um, from the European institution. They tend to be very black though. Um, a lot of information tends to be blacked out and you don't actually manage to see the precise detail of some of the operations that have been uh, actually conducted. Two minutes, okay. I'm going to go faster. So. How can this be seen as contributing to uh, seeing refugees and irregular migrants as a security threat? Well, of course, just because Frontex is involved does not necessarily mean it's seen as a security threat. Just because Frontex uh, conducts a risk analysis doesn't mean refugees are necessarily seen as a security <coughs> threat. However, there have been important um, dimensions to their activities. For instance, cooperation with third countries is an important dimension in Frontex works and in line with integrated border management. Something that is uh, maybe not as well known, but Frontex has a number of different agreements. And it's in a fantastic legal position for some of, if some of its activities because it can draw on its own <coughs> agreements with third countries, but it can also draw on national member states agreements. So for instance, Italy has an agreement with Libya. Frontex, if Italy is part of that um, uh, p particular operation, Frontex can also draw on that Italian agreement as a legal competence for some of its operations. So it has a multitude of agreements, therefore exponentially um, growing the amount of competences that you can get in terms of getting the agreement of third countries to manage your own borders in such a way that they do not manage to get into the European Union. I could read you some of the Council conclusions, but I'm not going to do that. Um, they would be quite incisive, but I'm not going to do that. Let me just give you a list of the different countries. And you're going to be quite, um, quite amazed with how many countries Frontex has agreements now. Uh, Russian Federation, 2006. Ukraine, 2007. Croatia, 2008. Moldova. Georgia. Fyrom, that is Macedonia. Serbia. Albania. Bosnia Herzegovina. United States of America. Montenegro. Belarus. Canada. Cape Verde. Nigeria. Armenia. Turkey. Azerbaijan. And a variety of working arrangements and a negotiation with Libya, Morocco, Senegal, Mauritania, Egypt, Brazil, and Tunisia. So I think I've given you quite a long list of different uh, arrangements that Frontex can get their hand on and that are then used as a tool to get the, um, in a sense, agreement to manage those borders in such a way that keeps people out. Now, I'm going to have to finish here. I hope that I've stimulated the discussion a little bit. I hope that my argument was clear. On the one hand, rights are uh, increasing, while on the other hand, we're keeping people out. 
and I hope that we will be able to discuss this in much more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. Indeed, uh, that's also what I kept from your uh, insightful lecture the most. So on the one hand, the developments within the EU has somehow in in increased the rights for refugees. So we heard of an extended reasons for prosecution, which I accepted as a legitimate right for granting asylum. We have heard that the reception conditions have been improved uh, um, and the EU prevented the race to the bottom. But at the same time, and that's maybe the backside of the medal, if you can't reduce the standards, then you reduce the numbers. And that's probably something that very well describes the general dilemma that EU migration policy is in. 20 minutes for Professor Abad. We are looking forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Volker, for your presentation. And thank you very much to the organizers for their kind invitation to me to talk at the Cairo Talks on Transformation and Change. I think this is a great initiative, uh, a great initiative to sponsor um, talks about transformation in the domestic, regional, interregional, and global system. And in fact, today we are dealing with an interregional or uh, global, uh, global issue. Your uh, CTTC started in 2011. Uh, the American University in Cairo started another forum, which is the uh, Tahrir Dialogues, also in 2011. And we also deal with issues of transformation and change, even if we bring together academics, politicians, and, um, and, uh, and, and activists. So uh, congratulations to the Free University of Berlin, to the Orient Institute in Beirut, and to uh, DAAD. Um, my, my remarks are neither about refugees nor about irregular migration. They are not either about international refugee law nor about the implementation, the application of international uh, refugee law even though it's a very interesting subject. I recognize that. In fact, I took the title of the session, which is EU Home Affairs and Migration Policy in the Mediterranean. And my focus is on migration. And I do not distinguish between regular and irregular, even though I include also, and I include refugees in, in, uh, in migration. To me, uh, this title, suggests that EU home affairs contribute to the realization of migration policy objectives, and migration policy contributes to the realization of EU home affairs objectives. EU home affairs objectives, home affairs is about internal security. And internal security in the Commission, in the DG, there was one DG for uh, Home Affairs and, and Migration. Then they were split, which also brings, uh, 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 brings up the relationship as seen in Europe between internal security and, and migration. They were split probably for purposes of increasing uh, the number of, um, of uh, commissioners. But internal security is a natural and legitimate objective of policy. I think it's only sufficient to look at Egypt, what happens in Egypt at present, uh, to, to understand that it is legitimate to pursue uh, internal uh, security uh, objectives. However, one policy has several objectives. And objectives are usually in conflict. In fact, if policy objectives were not in conflict, then policy making would not have been a problem at all. So by definition, the formulation of policy involves, involves choices and involves conciliation and involves trade-offs. Which objective do you want to realize today and which objective do you want to realize tomorrow? 
and to which extent what you realize today will sacrifice your other objectives of, of tumor. In the narrowest sense of the term, migration policy falls within the area of home affairs. And I already mentioned that it was one and the same uh, 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 DG in, uh, in Europe. But in a broader sense, migration policy has other objectives. The preservation of internal security is one of them, but it should not hinder the realization of other policy objectives of migration policy. Among these objectives in Europe, if you look at these objectives from the European perspective, you have some objectives which are purely European and others which are European, but also objectives uh, of concern to other countries and to other uh, populations. So in the coming minutes, rather than discussing internal security, I will take up the other policy objectives that should not be obscured by excessive focus on home affairs or on internal security. For the European Union, migration is essentially a labor market issue. Demographic challenges, such as low fertility, aging, mismatch between labor demand and supply, economic activities with new technological content, all of them command that migration not be hindered by restrictive security measures. And this is a pure European interest. With shrinking working age populations, shrinking labor forces, the need to support social security systems also advises that migration not be hampered. This again is a pure European interest. On the other hand, migration policy can also contribute to relieve pressures on labor markets of countries on the southern and eastern rim, rims of the Mediterranean. This represents interest for these countries as well as for Europe. Consequences of instability and turmoil in the south of the Mediterranean can extend to the northern coast of the basin. Of course, it is recognized that the problem is that European countries, especially the Mediterranean ones, are in a dismal situation, economically speaking. All the same, disequilibrium in any one region affects the region in its entirety. But there also are foreign policy objectives to migration policy. It is granted that geography is no longer what it was in determining foreign policy. However, it is still a factor to contend with. The southern countries of the Mediterranean are the closest to Europe, especially to the southern part of Europe. History and the environment have brought together the countries on all coasts of the Mediterranean. But we know that the center of gravity of the international system is moving east. It's mo for Asians, it's moving back. To the east. For Egypt, it has always been in the east, except for the last two centuries. So the center of gravity of the international system is moving to the east, to Asia. And the Mediterranean region, in the basin, is one region where Europe could keep influence and thus preserve its position in the world as the 21st century advances. A special consideration to the Mediterranean countries and to their development needs would help Europe do that. And then you have human rights and humanitarian concerns. These are 
values that are among the most important resources of the European Union in international action. It is not a burden. In fact, it's a resource. Not only is it uh, our human, human rights and humanitarian concerns. Uh, in fact, Europe has, and it has done well, by the way, it has imprinted the international system with these values. And Europe is keen on having these values pervade the international system. Because these are the values of Europe. And when you imprint the system with your values, you're putting yourself already in a privileged position. So European migration policies, if they are corrosive of human rights and ignore humanitarian concerns, they delegitimize the action of the European Union in favor of these rights and of these concerns at the global level. This would further undermine the standing of the EU and of its member states. And there is no real great cause for concern. The political changes of the last four years on the southern and eastern coasts of the Mediterranean did not generate too large migration and refugee flows to Europe. In the spring of 2011, there was alarm because uh, uh, some 25,000 uh, Tunisians tried to cross the Mediterranean. But then, in fact, the flows did not go much beyond that. So, Notwithstanding the tragic pictures and footage of small boats, boats crossing the Mediterranean, in fact, there is no great concern, there is no, no grounds for great concern if you look at the, at the question from the perspective of the European Union, not of the individual uh, individual uh, mig uh, uh, migrants or irregular migrants or smuggled uh, migrants. Yes, it is a tragedy for them, but you can have perspectives from different different sides. And the 25,000 uh, Tunisians that tried to cross were only a drop in the sea of irregular migration in, in Europe. So irregular mi migration should not be analyzed or looked at from the perspective of irregular migration. Migration is migration. Now, it can be regular, and at times it can be irregular, depending on the policies of country of destination and of countries of origin. Now, Syrian refugees constitute one of the crises of the major crisis of the 21st uh, century. There has been an increasing number of arrivals of Syrian refugees uh, uh, in Europe, certainly. Uh, I checked the, the, uh, uh, the figures uh, this morning, and there is an increasing. But yet, there are 1.5 million Syrian refugees in Lebanon. There are 700,000 Syrian refugees in Jordan. Somewhere, someone, somewhere like 700,000 in Turkey. In Egypt, there, is, there are different estimates, but at least there are 150,000 uh, refugees. Yes, so, so uh, 25,000, yes, is, is, is a considerable number, uh, but it is not such a burden. Uh, the number of uh, resettlement opportunities uh, offered uh, by Europe by the end of 2013 was 12,000, 12,500. In fact, 10,000 of which from Germany alone. Germany was the most, the most generous. Uh, the United States said uh, 20,000, but no one knows really how many, how many opportunities were, uh, were offered. So, so uh, the question, I think, it's either 
they and us, they and us, or us together. And this is the different perspectives to the same question, which make either for one approach to uh, dealing with the question or uh, for uh, different approaches at, at different level, levels. Transit migration through Arab countries on the southern shore of the Mediterranean is admittedly a challenge, a challenge to EU member states. Of course, they are also made as finance, yes. They are also made as challenges to North African countries. And North African countries are told, uh, you also are uh, countries of destination, you also are countries of, of transit, you are in the same boat. And many of these countries buy this, this version of the story. When in fact, uh, in Morocco, you have estimates are that there are between 20,000 20, and 60,000 uh, uh, irregular migrants from uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Does this make Morocco, which has 4.5 million migrants, does, is it the same? In fact, uh, you can even think that Morocco has always had 20,000 migrants from, uh, from Africa. In fact, say Sa uh, the Sahel. In fact, Morocco is a Sahel country as well, and Libya is a Sahel country, and Algeria is a Sahel country, because all of the south of these countries are in the Sahel. So it's how you conceptualize. In fact, in fact by buying uh, this, uh, this story, in fact, the North African countries place themselves in an island. They are cut on the north by the Mediterranean, the south as by the, uh, by the Sahara. So it's by their, own, by their own volition that they place themselves. So how you frame the issue is of immense importance. So it, the framing of the question is of immense importance, both to countries on the southern shore of the Mediterranean and to countries uh, on the northern shore. I'll, I'll, uh, two minutes, uh, uh, Yan. I think that to talk about Frontex, the image of, of Frontex and of patrons of member states indirectly, indirectly causing drowning and death of smuggled migrants and refugees are immensely negative for the EU, even if they're not responsive, but they are immensely negative. The perception is, is extremely important. Their benefits in terms of keeping irregular migrants out should be measured against their costs. A positive image of the EU as a concerned partner in bringing about development and political stability and in sharing humanitarian burden in the Mediterranean will be immeasurably beneficial. So, but what I, say, I said, should not be considered as a call for a totally unobstructed access to labor markets or to European territory. Because this is not realistic and it's not feasible. But what I just wanted to point out is that there is a need for rational and measured migration policies that take account foreign policy objectives, labor market, uh, uh, objectives, humanitarian objectives, and human rights uh, objectives. It is also, therefore, a call for migration policies to be integrated with economic development and cultural policies in a way that would redress or help redress regional imbalances. This integration should be carried out at the interregional and global level. It assumes a reconsideration of economic policies, global principles of global economic policies that generate unemployment, underemployment, poverty, and migration. And ironically, the consequences of these principles of global policies are felt on both shores of the Mediterranean and not only on the southern shore. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Professor Awad, for this extensive analysis of the situation and your uh, open and fair assessment of uh, the responsibilities we have on and the consequences we feel on both sides of the Mediterranean, in the north as well as in the south. And you call for a rational migration policy that is somehow uh, integrated into all these policy objectives that you mentioned, from human rights-based objectives to economic questions, labor market questions, and so on and so forth. And, and the, the direct question that we could discuss is, is it a bargaining between the, the rational and also legitimate uh, objective to obtain security versus a somehow normative, idealistic question of assuring human rights, helping the poor, the neglected, preparing the crown for a better future for so many people in the world? So that could be maybe the balance. And I prepared five questions, but as we have so many experts here in the audience, including my students, of whom I'm very happy that they are here tonight. I would like to open the floor directly. Um, we should take maybe half an hour of time for the discussion so that maybe at uh, quarter to nine we should come to an end. And if there are questions from your side, just give me a hand and then I will try to collect you in the, in the proper direction. Kevin Köhler first. Yeah, thank you very much for these uh, very interesting uh, contributions to this debate. Um, I have a question that is probably mainly addressed to Professor Cowden, um, because it uh, addresses what I think is, sorry, what I think is a, an important internal um, dynamic <coughs> of uh, migration policies. And you were talking about this, what you said is kind of a, a weird, somewhat contradictory dynamic between you know increasing the rights of refugees on the one hand and on the other hand, kind of trying to limit numbers. Now, don't you think that if you look at it from a perspective that uh, you know, takes into account dynamics between different member states in the European Union, that this is actually something that, uh, is, that you could describe as shifting the burden of migration because you kind of uh, increase uh, the rights of refugees as a collective effort of the EU, but still there are just as a matter of geography, there are countries that uh, are more affected by migration and certainly if you look at it from an Italian perspective that we seem to all share, kind of, uh, at least uh, you know, all the panelists here have this kind of perspective, at least temporarily I have it as well. The discourse in these countries is quite strongly in that direction that you know, it is perceived as something that is unfair and that you know, burdens, uh, unfairly burdens the southern European countries that are actually at the border of the EU. Thank you. I think we will collect three questions at the beginning, and Kevin Köhler from the AUC I know personally. The next is the gentleman here. Briefly introduce yourself before asking your question so that we have an idea about you. Okay, uh, I'm Sami Ammar, uh, ambassador of the Arab South Foundation to Egypt, and I work as a policy support to uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Khaled Abdelaziz, Minister of Youth and Sport of Egypt. Uh, actually, um, I have studied in Germany at Ferrari Universität, I have studied uh, climate change and migration. And um, at the first presentation, uh, it's mentioned that uh, it's all about uh, conflicts and migration. But actually, as I have studied politics of uh, North Africa and uh, many countries in Africa, uh, it's not usually about uh, conflicts because there are much many reasons for migration and uh, have for having refugees. For example, in Somalia, there are a lot of Somalian people who flee to Ethiopia and Kenya because of the uh, starvation and climate change. Uh, it happened again in Sudan just a few decades ago. They had to leave their homes because the uh, desertation and the environmental issues affected this area too much. So, and just a few days ago, I was in Pon. University of Pon, and it was uh, a seminar on climate change and uh, biodiversity, and how much many countries and nations suffered from uh, desertation and uh, environmental degradation because uh, the, many people had to had to uh, to adapt this, but they failed. They had to leave their homes because of, because of the environment. So it's not usually about conflict to have refugees or to have suffering people from these such issues or chaos. Thank you. Thank you. And the third question, in the very back. Uh, 
Thank you and good evening. I'm very glad that I snatched a seat at the very back of the room and I'd like to thank you very much for, for these fascinating uh, talks this evening. I'm Caroline Popp from the International Organization for Migration based here in Cairo. Um, yeah, it th throws up a lot of questions. Uh, two things that struck me was that neither of you mentioned, the, mentioned resettlement nor the very tenacious question of the, the Dublin Agreement in, in the Euro within the European Union. Perhaps you, you can uh, allude to, to that in, in your answers at some point. Um, but I, I wanted to address a, a larger point, um, very much to underline what was said that uh, when you look at the, the crossings of the Mediterranean and uh, the renewed uh, spike in, in boat crossings this year, that absolutely the, they, they reflect the sort of geopolitical, the conflict landscape that's unfortunately characterizing the region at the moment, um, with Syrians being among the top nationalities arriving. I'm, I'm drawing on statistics for Italy, which, which, we, uh, which, uh, which are very regular and, and consistent, um, as well as Eritrea being among the, the top nationalities. But I think it should also be, be recognized that um, the top 10, say the top 10 countries of origin of those who, who do make it across the, the Mediterranean are extremely diverse. Yes, Syria and Eritrea, but among those top 10 countries, you have countries from East Africa, from West Africa, um, <coughs> from North Africa, and that includes Egypt, um, and as far as uh, South Asia, Bangladesh, and, and, uh, and Pakistan. Just to say, the motivations, the, the reasons, the drivers that uh, are behind the, the, di the diversity of groups that cross the Mediterranean is extremely large. And, and the question that we ask ourselves at IOM every day is how to ensure better protection for all the groups, for all the human beings, for all the individuals who are on those journeys um, with terrific, terrible experiences in, in North Africa and obviously as, as they get on boats to the Mediterranean. Um, and, and I guess that's a little bit my question to you. It strikes me that what needs to be balanced or reconciled in, in the solutions is to look at the original drivers, the vulnerabilities, the, the violations, the persecution in many cases, and, and uh, motivations that, that put people on that path, but also the violations that are experienced de facto on en route, whether it be at the hands of smugglers or human traffickers or simply by virtue of the, 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 the routes that people are forced to take. And, the, and lastly, the contributions and the, the, the pool also that Europe um, extends, which Ibrahim Awad alluded to, and the, the possible contributions that people can can make and, and are required for in, in the European <coughs> Union. So if you had any thoughts on how to address really the, the breadth of uh, migration and uh, migration phenomena of, of migrant groups also that are trying to reach Europe, um, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would say Christian Kaunas answers first and then you can jump on it. Yeah. We will make a second round afterwards. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Well, thank you very much for the questions. I think they're excellent questions. Let me start with them in the order in which they were asked. Firstly, is it about shifting of the burden of migration? Well, some people might have a problem with the word burden there, but um, I think I know what you mean. Uh, and I would probably agree with you in the sense that if we look at also the third uh, question was asking about the Dublin Agreement. I mean, I was asked that in various conferences, how on earth did a country like Italy agree to something such as the Dublin Convention, later the Dublin Regulation? Yeah, I kind of wonder about that as well. I think if you look at the agreement in its pure form, you cannot understand why a country like Italy, why a country like Greece, why a country like Spain would agree to that. It makes no sense. It's it's clearly not in its interest. It's very much not in its interest. It's clearly putting the burden to where the kind of pressure points are. There's no doubt about that. I think if you want to ask historically why a country like Italy, Greece, Spain, was signing those agreements, you need to look at them when they were signed. 
because the Dublin Convention was signed in 1990. At the time, Italy was a good student in Europe. It wanted to adopt the Euro. It wanted to be a model European. It signed an agreement that was against its interest. Once you've signed that agreement, however, you're kind of stuck with it because now it's about changing the agreement. It's about reshifting the burden. And now that's much, much harder once the burden has been shifted in a particular way. A slight defense of the German position, though, because, of course, Germany is one of the countries that benefits from that agreement very much. I think to be fair to any German government, you also have to see what happened in the 1990s when Germany had a very, very high number of refugees. At the time, Germany was talking about, you know, let's kind of Europeanize the issues, let's kind of reshift the burden. Germany at the time, I don't know, was it 1993, just to give you a, a ballpark figure, had a number such as one million applications of refugee, just in one year. To just give you a kind of scale of what that means, when Britain had a massive asylum crisis, yeah, when, when it was absolutely top political priority in the press and everything. Britain had just one over 100,000 applications. Germany had 10 times what Britain had uh, in its highest year of pressure points. And at the time, Germany thought, how about European solidarity on those issues? Germany did not get a massive amount of European solidarity at that point. Um, so I'm not saying this agreement is great, and I'm not defending it in any way. I'm just saying, well, there's a bit of perspective. At the, at the time, the Italians that are now talking about European solidarity were not the first ones to answer European solidarity in the early 1990s. But it is about shifting the burden. I think we can talk about it, though I don't like the, the term burden. The second question, I think you're making an excellent case for why the Geneva Convention is, of course, um, slightly outdated. New forms of in a sense, refugees, such as environmental refugees, are not really taken account in the Geneva Convention. The Geneva Convention talks about persecution. The Geneva Convention has a set of reasons why you could be persecuted. Now, some of them you can kind of adapt. For, for instance, LGBT issues and all sorts of stuff. You can adapt the Geneva Convention for that. For environmental refugees, it's much, much harder because we are talking, you know, Convention specifically says persecution or fear of persecution, which makes it so hard because, of course, like you were saying, some of the environmental um, issues are not forms of persecution as such, but nonetheless they cause flows. So this is really a call to suggest, well, maybe we should redraft it. Now, I think normatively, I think you're spot on. I think there's a good reason why it should be redrafted. I think if we look at the situation in the world, it needs to be redrafted. There's a word of caution, though. I think if you started to redraft it with a political climate as you have it in some countries, such as the United Kingdom, for instance, um, it wouldn't be a redrafting upwards. It would become a redrafting downwards. That's the reality in many, many member states. If you were redrafting the Geneva Convention as it is now, and you would put it to a national parliament now for ratification, you would get a worse result, not a better result. That's not defending it. I think it should be redrafted and included. But, but a political reality in some countries, and I, I, and I see the migration debate in Britain as it is, it is quite dreadful and you wouldn't get a good result. Um, the last one, I think I've answered the kind of Dublin um, agreement question, and I, I think I hand over maybe the next speaker might have a better answer than I would. You want to add some comments? Uh, yeah, just, uh, just, just observation. We talked about Dublin 1990 and um, Spain, Italy. Well. How about Malta? Imagine Malta, small Malta. Huh? Yeah. Malta joined a key communautaire in huh, 2004, and it had to, it had to, to, to take this responsibility. See, yes, yes, of course. These are, this is European integration. This is, a pro, this is about the process of European integration, in fact. And which probably also explains that some, some parts of migration action has become intergovernmental again, uh, rather than, rather than uh, integrated. Now, 
I think the question of the 1951 uh, convention and whether it applies to uh, environmental refugees, I think this is uh, this is a very a very complex, uh, very complex situation. <clears throat> there has been talk about uh, whether a new instrument uh, could be um, could be drafted and adopted. I I, I think. I, from what I understood, I, I'm very skeptical about the possibility of, uh, of reaching international agreement in 1951. Uh, the, the Second World War had just finished, and uh, uh, the, in, the world was small, uh, some 50 countries, 55 uh, states. Uh, it's very difficult now to, to imagine that. The, and I think there also is the question of definition of refugee. Because uh, an environmental refugee is not like a refugee fleeing a conflict, because refugees usually uh, flee suddenly. An environmental refugee would not necessarily uh, uh, flee uh, suddenly. So there, there may be problems of, um, of definition as well. Now, uh, 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 with regard to what uh, Caroline uh, Pop said, of course, I think uh, uh, we were both discussing European European policy and not necessarily not necessarily issues related to international criminal law as well and uh, the uh, uh, the the Palermo protocols and and, uh, and others I think that uh, there are many drivers and this is why I think uh, we should look at economic and uh, and social policy um, for instance, one, one driver uh, that is discussed in the literature is that uh, with liberalization of international trade and with um, uh, subsidies to uh, cotton in the United States and other uh, cotton growing countries, uh, uh, um, the, the uh, Malians, uh, the Burkina Bay who work, who grow cotton uh, are out of work they do not, cannot grow uh, cotton. So in fact, they, uh, they uh, go to the coast of the Mediterranean, but there uh, the owners of uh, f small fishing boats cannot fish any longer because of the large uh, fishing fleets uh, in the Mediterranean. So what they do is that they transport them. They transport those who do not have work because the uh, boat owners do not have work either in fishing, so the, so in fact, you have to address migration. Migration, as such, as such, uh, uh, I think I have uh, some of my students here, and uh, I say this: the migration, as such, you know, is a question. It's a poor question to discuss. Migration uh, is interesting because it has uh, connections to economic policy, to foreign policy, uh, to uh, uh, to development policy. Uh, this is what makes. Uh, to education uh, uh, policy. This is what makes the interest of migration and I think what uh, has brought many people here today. Thank you very much. Second round of question, Professor Boni, I think, and Basan Hasib, and sh give me a sign if you want to Michele answer. Boni, University of Modern. I have a very simple question. What is the rationale of reducing refugees, the number of refugees? I mean, 150 people are really a small number in face of the needs of Europe. Um, so I, if I take the definition provided by Professor Arad and I look at migration in a general sense, I don't know why we should look at the refugees a different way and not consider them inside the general need Europe have as of, of immigrants. And that number, even the Italian Institute of Statistics evaluated our need is about 350,000 per year. So 150 is not. I see, I, I, I would like to understand who pushed in, <laughs> in the idea of we need to reduce them. Thank you. And Basant, two rows behind. I think the problem of migration from what I understood from you is three-dimensional. From one side, we have the problem of solidarity, which I don't know how the EU is going to solve this problem. And with burden sharing, especially with the Lampedusa crisis that happened and the refugees coming from Tunisia to uh, Italy. And on the other, the other dimension is the, 
if the EU really wants to reduce the numbers, it has to improve, its in uh, improve incentives with third countries in order to, ha to cooperate with them to, uh, with the pushback oper operations with third countries in order to control migrants coming from the south to the north, which is actually <coughs> uh, difficult with uh, incentives like uh, visa facilitation and these kind of incentives with the solidarity problem and the co incohesion between member states, visa facilitation is not um, feasible for, uh, to be um, uh, achieved for uh, third countries. And if the third countries agree to uh, sign mobility partnership agreements, it means that they will actually uh, start doing pushback oper operation, which is against the non-reformal uh, principle which uh, takes us back to the human rights violation issues. So if we solve one issue, there is another problem coming, coming from another direction. So I think it's very, very complicated and I don't know if I'm <laughs> in the if, uh, uh, situation or the position of the EU, I don't know what to do actually. So I don't know what's the solution now. Thank you. More questions here in front? Hi, Harry Cook, IOM. <coughs> um, this is to follow on from Professor Bruni's question, actually. Um, so, <coughs> and uh, addressing to um, Christian Kaunitz. Um So, yeah, it seems you have this rational choice model for policymakers, which is, you know, there's a certain um, cost to the number of people you let in versus the level of protection that people get. Um, at the same time, we, you know, we know that people are not necessarily uh, net cost um, when they are let in, as Professor Bruni has, has said. Um, <coughs> so, I mean, you know, how much does, you know, how much did Einstein cost Europe, you know, as a, as a refugee? Um, and then at the same time, you know, we, have, we are basically making the situation incredibly acute in the Levant um, at the risk of, you know, stability, um, which could end up having a massive net cost. Um, and then at the same time you, so I mean I guess in your model, I mean it's not just purely economic cost, I mean it's also a political cost. Um, and then you were saying earlier, um, before you got to that point, that people had used sort of EU institutions as a way almost to kind of reduce that political cost in their decision making, you know, as a way to, um, I suppose, um, yeah, you know, be able to take these decisions without there being such a big political cost. So my question is, um, why don't we see politicians trying to reduce that political cost um, in other ways, particularly through looking at those kind of points and looking at the bigger sort of foreign policy perspective on the Middle East? Thank you. Thank you very much. We take more questions after this round when we have a final round. <coughs> I think, I, think um, I, I, I also join my, my voice to what Professor Bruni has said. There is a question of demand for labor. It's a question of a labor market. So, in fact, this is uh, one major determinant. It should be one major determinant of, of policy. But, of course, Professor Bruni, you know that uh, uh, policy making is not always very rational. Huh? Nowhere is it, uh, is it very rational, and especially with the political scene where uh, there has been for years and decades uh, cultivating of... Uh, uh, some uh, uh, closed perspectives uh, to internal and to international politics. And this, of course, uh, uh, this is a constraint also on, on, and this, in fact, takes me to the, to the uh, lady who, who talked. Yes, it is, it is a difficult situation because, in fact, you have nurtured a discourse which creates constraint on your freedom of action and or your freedom to formulate policy. In fact, one may ask a question, uh, one day migration policy will have to change. How will you justify changing them when this day comes? Uh, and, and in fact, uh, uh, many people also are oblivious to the fact that the southern Mediterranean region uh, will not have many workers to offer uh, 20 years from now. In fact, uh, aging is also affecting uh, the uh, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, not Egypt, but Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria. It's also affecting them. So where will the reserve uh, come from? Certainly not from Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, 
So where will, will the reserve come from? So I think policy also should plan in, in advance. Uh, I think economic cost and political cost, I think I, 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 I address that from another perspective. Yes, there is a policy. In fact, you can, you can, you can pay a cost, uh, even if you achieve your objectives uh, uh, calculated economically, but you can pay a much higher cost uh, politically, which will also affect you economically uh, down the road. Yes, this, this also is, I think, it's, it's a dilemma, a dilemma for policy. But then you should adapt your, your discourse. You should adapt how you frame issues to what you want and what you intend to do. Right, thank you very much for all those questions. Very good. Um, let me just start first. Um, uh, please don't misunderstand me. I did not suggest that we should reduce the numbers of refugees. I did not suggest that at all, and I, I, I would never suggest that. Um, let me just a little bit explain why for decision makers they perceive reducing the number of refugees as a positive thing. Now, I think in any migration statistic you can see that migrants in general contribute far more to the economy than, than they take out of it. You can see a variety of different statistics and so on. I think there's been general consensus on, on these figures. I mean, certainly seen many in Britain and um, they, you know, time and time and again, you see how they're contributing more to the economy than they're taking out. The case of refugees is slightly special because refugees are by definition for the first year excluded from the labor market. They're not allowed to work. As a result of not being allowed to work, they cannot contribute to the labor, to the labor market because they're not allowed to work. So that's why in a sense, but, but EU legislation nonetheless provides for certain reception conditions. Those reception conditions, obviously, whether you think the cost is right or wrong, it, it does carry a cost while at the same time they're being excluded from the labor market, so they cannot possibly contribute um, to the cost that they're creating. Now, this is a political choice. I'm not saying this is a good choice, um, but it is a political choice, and the choice has been taken at some point. One, because um, policymakers were uneasy about just letting people into the labor market that they did not choose before. They just happened to arrive. They didn't choose them and they, they don't want to necessarily just let them run on the labor market. Partially because in some countries it, it created a certain negative image that um, I guess the political choice of letting them um, start in the labor market was one that was felt wasn't, wasn't very easy to take. I mean, your question is, is quite right. How can politicians maybe think of other ways to reduce those political costs? I would very much hope so. I hope so, because what I'm seeing at the moment in different member states is not very encouraging. Like I'm telling you, um, coming from the United Kingdom at the moment, there's a very, very deranged migration debate going on the, uh, at this point. We have all sorts of very strange um, arguments being made where uh, people um, ratch up the rhetoric very, very strongly, where it's being said that migrants supposedly um, uh, get wise, where migrants supposedly um, <laughs> take away the country of some people. That's really the rhetoric that some politicians are using, certainly UKIP and so on. They're really using the, the language that they're taking away my country. It's not the country that I wanted. And, uh, that sort of thing anymore. Now in this particular climate, unfortunately, and I'm again not I'm condoning it at all, but for some politicians what that means is that they're, they think of the next election. The lex next election is in Britain is in May 2015. They think that by May 2015 the rhetoric hasn't calmed down. By May 2015, if they don't run with the rhetoric that is a given right now, they're going to lose their seat. And I think a lot of them will lose their seats, even the ones that don't come out. Now, if you look at that on a, on a broader scale, unfortunately, it's not just an isolated development that we're seeing in Europe at the moment. We see that in, 
in uh, Britain, but we see that also in France. Marine Le Pen in France, uh, according to the latest opinion polls, uh, would beat François Hollande in the second round if she ever came to it. And at the moment, she looks quite quite likely to enter the second round. She might actually, if, if, if François Hollande was her opponent, she would beat him in the second round of the second. You, you could end up, I'm not suggesting that we will, and I hope we won't, but you could end up in a situation that is very, very dire. You see that running around a number of different European countries, and unfortunately, some of that has led to politicians scrambling for solutions. They're not rational. Um, they're short-termist, extremely short-termist, but they fear that um, what is expected of them could be so bad that they're willing to, to go down that route. I don't think it is an actual solution to come to Bassan's uh, question. Uh, I don't think it is an actual solution. Um, from everything that I can see, what politicians do is they talk more about it, they talk more negatively about migration, um, and the more the people the public gets worried and actually is a kind of a uh, self-fulfilling prophecy as it were where they talk about it a lot and suddenly more more people are convinced that it really is a problem even the ones that weren't convinced about it so much before are suddenly starting to be convinced again if we look at UKIP um, in Britain we see some of the, um, the the constituencies with the lowest number of foreigners that have the highest voting share for UKIP. This isn't necessarily a rational cost-benefit analysis. This is a kind of a fear and scaremongering. Uh, but nonetheless, it's real for those politicians that try and fight it. Don't think they're fighting it with the right solutions, but they think they're fighting it. Thank you very much. And one way, Aidan, that for example, in the times of economic crisis, particularly in the south of Europe, Many people who are from within the European Union migrate into the still economically stronger countries and the job that has been taken by a Greek is not open for Egyptian any longer. And that's probably something that squeezes the, the readiness to welcome people from outside the EU even further. We make a last round of question. Due to the time, please keep it short and precise. The gentleman in the almost back. So uh, thank you to invite. And uh, maybe my question is uh, so naive. Uh, I, th I speak about uh, the people who don't refuse to be a refugee. What about the crisis in the future? How can we deal with them? So thank you. Could you specify what you mean with the crisis in future? You mean conflicts in the region? The, people, the people who don't refuse this idea, if we have been changed their mind. Yeah, me too. Are there more questions? Because otherwise, yes, please, Aida. Thank you very much for this talk. I, this is just an idea that came up to my mind right now. Uh, shall we consider migration as the new security dilemma inside the EU? Thank you very much. And one more question, and then we close it indeed. Um, again, mine is a bit of um, an observation as opposed to a question, really. But again, because I think we've used the term um, refugee and migrant uh, interchangeably, and I think that's very important to clarify. Um, I think my colleague alluded to that a bit, uh, Caroline, back there, that most of the people actually that land on European shores are not refugees or are not even seeking asylum. They're seeking better employment and better opportunities. And that's the vast majority. Only recently have we started seeing people seeking asylum. That's a very important um, point to make. Then, um, what are the possible, again, solutions? I mean, again, I go back to what Professor Bruni mentioned and what um, Professor uh, Awad mentioned is that actually Europe needs migrants. So the solution is actually, it's there, it's important. Um, Professor um, Christian said that the governments are um, using it as a political tool to attract their constituencies. Well, why, do, why doesn't the opposition instead use, you know, have, have perhaps a better voice in actually voicing the importance of, as you mentioned, the importance of the, contribu the, contribu the important contributions made by the migrants to those communities. So I think that's one. For, for, for the economic migrants, that's possi one possible solution is, um, or an ideal solution, perhaps very naive, 
but is better labor policies because it, it, they are required as clearly mentioned by uh, Professor Awad and by Professor Bruni um, earlier. For the refugees, there is also a solution and the solution is resettlement programs. We just look at recent history, very recent history in the Eastern Europe, I mean the Balkan Wars, not war, but wars, and the amount, uh, the numbers given to, um, uh, to, re to, to refugee resettlement as an opportunity for Eastern Europeans were close to 100,000. 100,000 just from Eastern Europe. And today we're looking at numbers that are 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. So the solutions are there, the opportunities are there, and the costs are, it's, it's possible, it's feasible. So just an observation more than a question, thank you. Thank you very much. Who wants to start to make the final reply? Okay, shall, shall, shall I go first? Okay. I'll start with your questions uh, last first. I think uh, my answer to you would be yes and no. Yes, in the sense that there clearly is a lot of people who come to the shores of Europe who are seeking employment, who are seeking a better life. I think there's no denying that there's plenty of them. Now, however, I would caution overstating the argument because if you look at mere statistics of asylum applications, you might sometimes find that you have a low number. I would caution against inferring from that that they're not refugees. And the reason is simple. For instance, um, Spain for many, many years had very, very low refugee numbers. The reason for that was not that the people were not refugees, but that the asylum procedure in Spain was very onerous. It didn't look worthwhile for people to claim for asylum. So instead, they managed to live a life as an irregular migrant because that was actually not so difficult in Spain. They could sign up to the Padron, they could get national health service, they could actually work irregularly, but they could work nonetheless, they could make money and so on. So for many people, it felt like the better solution. That does not mean that legally speaking they would not have had a case. It just means that they chose not to uh, pursue that case because, and if you if you then look at uh, figures, and you can find that kind of statistic in a variety of European countries, and, and I know sometimes I've, I've interviewed some of the perm reps in Brussels, some, sometimes um, they do mention to you, oh well, we don't have an asylum problem, we don't have that many refugees. Yes, you don't, because your procedures are too onerous, so people don't actually want to claim, not because those people by themselves wouldn't wouldn't necessarily be a refugee. So I think you're right in, in some ways, but also it's difficult. Um, it is sometimes a complex issue, and therefore the case shouldn't be overstated. In terms of resettlement progr programs, I think they're a great thing, they're a great tool, but of course <laughs> they always depend on the willingness of those member states that take part in it. And the willingness is not always forthcoming. Uh, or they tell you, oh, well, we'll take 15 people of those, then we'll take another 20 of those. We've had that discussion just before, before our talk, which is problematic, A, eh? the selection, you can discuss the ethical dimension of the selection process, and secondly, the numbers are no, nowhere near the real numbers that are needed. So you can, you can use resettlement programs, and I think it's good that they exist in parallel to the normal uh, asylum application process. But um, they're not the only solution to the problem they couldn't possibly be because member states will never offer the kind of numbers that you would need to really address the problem. In terms of Aida's question, I think I would, I would say hopefully not would be my answer. Hopefully um, migration is not the EU's new security dilemma. I, I hope we can kind of keep migration and security as, as separate as we can, I realize when they overlap in terms of content and so on. Certainly with refugees, there's a security dimension at the essence of being a refugee. Not in all cases like we've seen with environmental refugees, but nonetheless there is a security dimension in there. I would not, again, advocate having too much of it though. Um, okay, I'll hand over now, thank you. It's <coughs> yeah. yeah, I was talking about uh, whether um, migration is a new security dilemma. You know, it depends on, on how you frame the issue. And obviously it is framed by uh, many as the new security dilemma. And uh, if, 
one issue uh, that distinguishes right-wing parties from center-left parties in Europe is, in fact, migration. And for right-wing parties, it is a security issue. And where you are in the far right, it's also an identity issue. And you had, you had a major country in Europe which for a couple of years had a ministry in which, in its, the title of which it had, and, and national identity. Uh, so yes, yes, I think. But is it really a security, a security issue? This is the question, really. Is it really a security issue? No, it is. It is. Uh, of course, it depends. Huh? For me, it's, it's not. For Professor Bruni, it's not. Maybe for someone else. For Marine Le Pen, it's something, it's something else. But, but now, now, there are objective measures, and there are needs in the labor market. And, and the, the, not only the economies, but the standing of the countries uh, with, uh, with decree. You, you do not have any major power in the history of the world which had a small population. You never had one. You never had one with an aging population, an aged population. So it's, it depends. It depends. It's a choice, you know, which choice you make. Uh, so, so yes, I think that for some it is. And it is uh, being made as, as, as a security issue. Now, uh, uh, it is up to you to, to judge whether it really is uh, or not. With respect to what uh, Amr Taha said, I think, yes, this is a very interesting observation. Uh, refugees, migrants, yes, you have a definition of a refugee. Now, it's very difficult to distinguish a refugee from a migrant. Uh, and a refugee who is not recognized as such is a migrant at the end of the day. And in Southern Europe, uh, I, I, I mean, in addition to what uh, Professor Conrad said, in Southern Europe, you had irregular migration. No? Forget about the recent crisis. But it is in Northern Europe that you, have, you had asylum seekers. No? Why in, in Southern Europe? Because of labor market issues also. Because of the informal economy. No? The informal sector huh, attracted. So the, the Northern European countries, which have more modern economies, cannot really attract irregular migrants. No? They do, everywhere. Regular market. But they cannot really attract the regular But Italy, yes. Italy, yes. Greece, yes, of course. So this is why you have more irregular migration than, uh, than in, uh, in Northern Europe. Resettlement opportunity, yes, it is one of the famous uh, three solutions. But uh, as Professor Conrad said, you'll never have the numbers. I mentioned, I mentioned in my intervention that for all the Syrians, by 2000, end of 2013, Europe had offered 12,400 or something. Uh, compared to 3 million uh, uh, refugees, uh, you, you will judge. Yeah? Uh, of course, it is, not, it is not to say that uh, European countries do not have their own legitimate concerns. Yeah? I, I, I'm not suggesting that. But I'm saying that this will remain as, as a problem. And it has, it has to be addressed. Otherwise, I think the whole system, you will have a systemic uh, question there, uh, a systemic question. And it has to be addressed uh, jointly by all, I think. I am sad and happy at the same time, I should admit. Uh, I'm sad because I have the impression we touched on so many interesting topics. And it would be so interesting now to go well into detail and to discuss all these different aspects that you brought up in your questions and that you responded to very briefly, uh, that we had more time to discuss that in detail. And um, I hope that we have another occasion where we can discuss questions related to migration, to migrants, refugees on another occasion here in the German Science Center. At the same time, I'm very happy because I hope you agree in my impression that we had an extremely interesting evening with two extremely well-informed and distinguished researchers, scholars, and policy advisors on the um, difficult topic on migration. And on behalf of the German Science Center, particularly the Free University in Berlin and the Orient Institute Beirut, I would like to thank you. And I said at the beginning that we met at the first time in Florence, in Italy. So I thought as the, as the Christmas season is coming soon, and Italy is famous for more, so many things, particularly its panettone, Thank you so much. I don't know if you like it, but if you don't like it, I would be interested myself. 
if you want to hear more about migration, maybe we have another occasion at the German Science Center. For sure, we can have another occasion next Monday at 7 o'clock. The Center on Refugees and Migration Studies from the AUC is organizing another evening talk event at the Tahir Dialogue. Tahir Dialogue Series. Uh, it's at, yeah, it's in CRMS seminar at the Tahir location or campus of the AUC with Christian Kaunert next Monday at 7 p.m. If you're interested, you're of course invited to come there. And as you can see from the camera, we produce a podcast that will be online in a couple of days on our website. So check it regularly. Join us on Facebook, the German Science Center, the Freie Universität. Berlin or the DAD, and then you will get the information once it's online, so you can listen to all the statements again. Last but not least, it's my special honor to invite you all for a dinner reception with a buffet outside. It might be a little bit chilling, but the food is, as always, very good. And if you have the time, stay with us a little bit longer. And also our speakers have some time to respond to more questions if you do it in a decent way. Thanks for coming. <laughs> have a good evening and hope to see you soon again. Thank you very much.